Um, yeah, I'm Libby. I'm a fifth year PhD student here at ASU in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Um, I talked to you a couple days ago about my astronomy work. Um, today is kind of my other hat with um, CubeSat work. There's my clicker. There we go. So the um, kind of broad picture tagline of this talk is going to be students sending stuff to space. Um, as many of you in the small sat community might know, space missions are becoming more accessible than ever. Um, CubeSats in particular offer opportunities to launch new technology for relatively low cost and low consequence and allow students to get involved in the building and development of space missions. In particular, projects like GNU Radio and SatNogs make support communications easy for beginners. And so I'm going to encourage you not to think about this talk as a new cool thing I did with GNU Radio, but as someone uh, using these tools for the first time. And I'm just going to tell you kind of what was helpful for me and what we did. Um, so my background, um, I'm not a comms engineer. I'm an astronomer. Usually astronomy is not actively trying to talk to us or prevent itself from being heard. I certainly hope that astronomy is not encrypted. Um, but obviously, this depends on your personal views about the universe. Um, and so I just want to talk a bit, little bit about some tools that were useful to me coming from astronomy into comms engineering. Um, this also might end up reading a little bit as a thank you note to Daniel Estevez's GR Satellites project and also SatNogs. They're going to come up a lot here. So I'll do a brief um, talk about the Interplanetary Lab. So the IPL at ASU um, is not only a student space lab, but a lot of what it does is um, student space work. So it's a lab that has a whole bunch of space flight testing equipment, the usual stuff like machine shop tools and soldering benches, but also um, in-house thermal vac testing, a vibe test bed, anechoic chamber, ADCS pointing test bed, all the good stuff. Um, so the IPL has been, I think, in use for a couple years and was largely where Lightcube was developed. Lightcube itself is an educational mission on two fronts. So um, kind of the tagline I have here is built by students, operated by anyone. You do have to have a ham radio license. Um, the payload is a xenon flash tube that is triggered um, by ham radio operators, and it should produce a naked eye visible flash. So you can go out with your ham radio, command the CubeSat to flash, and you'll be able to actually interact with it and see it um, respond to you with your own eyes. Like you was launched on April 24th from the ISS, and it operated for just under 24 hours before we had a comms failure. And we were actually able to track down um, why our comms failed, which was um, almost as exciting as the CubeSat actually working. Being able to know why it stopped working was particularly, um, at least like as a secondary thing, very useful. Um, to reiterate some of the stuff on the previous slide, here is the block diagram. I didn't work in particular on the CubeSat design as a whole, so if you have any more specific questions, I can direct you to the right people. But the main things I just want to point out again are these xenon flash tubes that are on the sides of the CubeSat um, in this particular diagram, um, as well as the deployable UHF antenna, which was how all our comms were done. The telemetry was um, one of three types. So on three different cadences, the CubeSat transmitted a heartbeat packet as well as a full telemetry and orientation packet. Um, the uplink commands are over dual tone multi-frequency, so DTMF tones. And the um, downlink telemetry was audio frequency shift keyed. You can see a, a high quality light cube pass on the right over there. Um, that's what our AFSK modulation scheme looks like. Our carrier was 437.175 megahertz, so amateur radio band. Um, and we had a baud rate of 300. Um, and I have the mark and space frequencies there as well for um, the Bell 103 protocol that was used. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about SatNogs, which was very critically useful to us. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the SatNogs project, but it is the Lieber Space Foundation Satellite Networked Open Ground Stations Project, which provides a network of um, amateur stations. So they provide tutorials if you want to build your own amateur station. ASU does have a ground station. And they also provide the ability to schedule observations of um, any satellite, I think, not just amateur ones. They have a really nice dashboard interface, so you can see the dashboard for Lightcube here that has all of the relevant information for the satellite. 
um, as well as places where you can download data, et cetera. Um, and this ended up being really critical to us figuring out why our CubeSat stopped talking to us because we only had 24 hours worth of data and SatNogs was really, really um, critical in getting us that coverage. Um, to show that again, I hope this is okay resolution. I, it's quite a saturated plot, but I went to the SatNogs API and I pulled down all of the known locations of SatNog stations, those are the black X's, and then the red squares are SatNog stations that we were actually able to get and decode light cube telemetry from. Um, had we been only operating with our own ground station, you would only see a red dot in Arizona, but as you can see, we got pretty good coverage from a lot of different locations. The actual demodulator was all done in a GNU Radio Companion flow graph. Um, I've seen a whole bunch of people put these up on their slides and I can never read them, so I'll just talk you to the basic steps. Uh, this one assumes that you're using a file source, but there are also versions of this flow graph that work for a live hardware decode or a SatNogs audio file. Um, this particular file source is assuming um, raw IQ, so you do have to do the narrowband FM receive yourself. SatNogs does that for you if you're using a SatNogs observation. The AFSK scheme then needs to be demodulated to soft symbols, converted to hard symbols, and then we have to sync on some sort of packet preamble. We use the amateur call sign in the Lightcube packet header here. Um, and then there's a bunch of data massaging just for the particularities of our modem. And then those packets are written out over a UDP sync to um, a, pa a Python packet parser, as well as written to a file for later use. So this was able to be used both by the Lightcube team and we put it up onto the SatNogs forums and we had a couple interested amateur parties who were able to use this flow graph to get their own Lightcube decodes. Um, and now I will point out that this was heavily supported by the GR satellites package. Um, Daniel Estevez, who I think has been mentioned a bunch of times uh, in this conference, um, has this lovely package that does, um, that has some drag and drop demodulators. So this AFSK demodulator that you see in my flow graph is a drag and drop um, from that package. I think I use a couple other blocks of his, like the sync and create packed PDU. Um, and this was especially critical. Um, I did build this from scratch at first so I could learn how to do it. So I made my own AFSK demodulator and having something to compare it to was really particularly useful for me. The published version uses the GR satellites one because it does work slightly better than mine. Um, a little bit of statistics, we got 531 packets from our CubeSat over that roughly 24 hours. About 80% of them were usable after basic um, checksum. And here's where I get to the, the kind of interesting part is that when we went back and we looked at all of our received packets, almost all of them had a reported battery temperature from the CubeSat of at or below zero degrees Celsius. Zero degrees Celsius is the minimum recommended operating temperature of the batteries used for light cubes. So that was not a very positive sign. Another view of that is I plotted the solar altitude at the CubeSat location versus the battery temperature. And you can see that it is very much correlated. Um, so when there is good solar irradiance, the CubeSat warms up a little. When it's in the shade, it's very cold. Uh, we tracked this down to an issue where the battery heater was left in a pre-launch testing configuration, turned off, so the CubeSat was pretty much at the mercy of natural solar heating. Um, and I will again say that uh, had we not had all those great SatNogs observations, we probably would have had three points on this plot, which wouldn't have been super exciting. So a couple of conclusions. Um, lessons learned from Lightcube will be used for future missions, both in the sense of like actual lessons learned of what went wrong, and in the sense of um, Lightcube was a big team of many students who learned a lot building the project and will go on to work on future missions and, and use what they learned. We think that we're unlikely to hear from Lightcube again, just because there's been a pretty long lapse in communications now, but we are still looking out in case it ends up in an orbit that has um, a lot of time in the sun and it warms up and communications start again. Um, and projects like SatNogs and GR satellites are great and really useful for beginners. Um, consider contributing or using. Um, I'm happy if anyone from those projects is here or online to kind of discuss issues that I ran into that might be useful for you. 
And if you want to le uh, learn a little more, I have a couple contacts here. You're obviously welcome to contact me. Um, Christopher did the DTMF part of the comms, so he's also um, perfectly capable of answering any of your comms questions. And if you have more general questions about the CubeSat, um, Jaime or Professor Jacobs at ASU are both um, kind of higher in the light cube hierarchy and can answer more broad questions. If I have any questions. All right. Sam, are you say okay? Do we have a question? Okay, you do have a question, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so you you talked about it potentially getting in a different orbit. Is it still, are you tracking where it is? It hasn't uh, burned up yet or? Yeah, um, I don't actually remember how long it's expected to stay in orbit, but it definitely still is. And I think we still have pretty good TLEs for it. So we're able to schedule SATNOGS observations. You like to get your TLEs? I, oh, that's a good question. I don't remember where I got the ones that I used to make the plots in this um, presentation, and I also don't remember where SATNOGS get theirs from, but SATNOGS does have a TLE on the satellite dashboard page, so you can look at um, where that one came from if you're interested. I see no more hands. I'm going to ask, other than this being really, really cool, like what's the point of having a satellite that goes blink? Is, it, <laughs> is there a scientific additional value? Uh, not a scientific value. So I very briefly mentioned that it was educational on two fronts. So the point was to be able to have um, the public interact with the CubeSat. So it was very much educational. In fact, uh, kind of the opposite of science. A lot of astronomers <laughs> did not like it, but... <laughs> Well, I like it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I guess everyone, you also liked it. So one more round of applause.